all levels, from knows the law, and knows La Raza, you know, can walk into the Capitol and talk to somebody on any level, and will walk out and go get some elote con queso. Uh, right. and, some yes. and it's the same person. Who is somebody that people know and can relate to us and has a story to tell us, has a story about her community, has a story about herself, and has a message for us to, to move this forward. And we want to, every time we talk about how we inaugurated Movimiento Texas, we want to bring up that name as basically our, our, our padrino or madrina when we're talking about who should it be. And it was easy to get to this name. Um, with no further ado, I want to introduce y'all, Ms. Rosy Castro, who is here. And Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Let me bring you that. Some of you I've uh, known from other cities, Houston, Douglas is here, El Paso, Norma is here, and others that I haven't seen yet, Patricia here from San Antonio, Gabriel, and uh, It's great to see all of you. Um, and it's really particularly great to see, because in looking at you, I'm reminded a lot of what happened in Brasilia. And that was that people who were young and people who were older joined a movement that was uh, unique to the state of Texas and that people said couldn't be done. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that because I was asked to do that and a couple of other, other things that we um, helped organize or were involved with. First of all, I'm telling you that what you are engaging in, what you have already engaged in, is something that our community desperately needs. I think for a long time there's been kind of a wall, and although there's groups that have been trying to organize, um, this last few years we're finally seeing a great wave of organization that I think will have substantial change. And I want to say that a few years back, maybe five or eight years back, I started to see in this country what reminded me so much of the 60s and 70s. And that was the incredible kind of backlash against people with brown skin who spoke Spanish merely because of those things. Um, it's been great to see that many young people have challenged that. The dreamers have taken on their own self-determination and challenged uh, for us and brought us into the fray. I remember one of the big marches here in San Antonio it was interesting to see the dreamers lead that, but all of these old timers from every kind of Rasmina, from uh, Mexican American movement, everyone who could still walk, uh, who was fortunate enough to still walk, came out to be supportive. And of course, that included the mayor, who was my son at the time, and I um, Let me just give you a little bit of my background. You're talking about your own stories. I was asked to do that. Do that my mother and her sister, my mother was six, my aunt Lina was about four, they were orphaned in Mexico. And so um, after going through a series of people there that couldn't really help bring them up, they were sent to San Antonio with a family. Uh, and it was two different households that they come to, came to live in. So my mother and her sister, having lost both parents, now come to a new country live in different households, and so life was very difficult for her. My mother was taken out of school, which was in third grade, so she basically learned English and Spanish on her own. She learned how to read, but consequently, as we heard before, her options were limited in terms of career choices. She wound up being a maid, being a babysitter, doing cooking, doing basically whatever she could as a single parent to help try and raise me. Uh, I often think about it, my godmother, who's about 88, 89, tells me, because they grew up together, 
often tells me the story that my mother had wanted to be a news reporter. She had hoped to see her, her name in the newspaper, that she really had these visions of being able to do that. And of course, she never got to do that. But it explained why she'd always drag me out in front of um, La Feria to sing a song and taste the She always had, you know, it wasn't going to be her dream, it was going to, her daughter was going to be able to do something. Well, um, one of the things that, that she did was that she made sure that because she hadn't had an education, that it was drilled into me. Not that I could, I might, possibly I would go to school. And so she and my guardian made sure that I continued uh, in school. I went to a Catholic school for 12 years. Needless to say, I had the gospel. We went to church six days a week. And I had the gospel. And as organizers, you know that the gospel is something that tells you a lot about values, that tells you about social justice, that has a way of looking at the world that formulates very early on in a child a great basis for the values that you will grow up with. After high school, one of the things we did in high school, I went to high school with very few people at Little Flower, and in my graduating class was 26 people. Uh, I didn't want to go to family school, I wanted to go to public school, but they had a lot of fun. <laughs> and so what we wound up doing was organizing a youth club. And that was probably one of the first times that I learned that you could organize things that would be a benefit to everyone. Uh, and it was that, that time I became the president of youth club and it was CYO, for those of you that are old enough to remember CYO, we had to uh, go give speeches all the time. So very early, I got used to being able to stand up in front of people and not let it bother me. So one of the things I've learned about organizing that I know you already know or will learn is that everything you do is a life experience that will last for a long time. That you learn a great deal and that the people that work with you, because organizing is never about you. It's about the community. It's about those people that are doing things with you um, that also must have leadership opportunities, that also must be given trust and must be given the chance to grow themselves. Uh, and if you don't do that as an organizer, then really you haven't met um, what should be happening in organizing. I want to point to our middle way, another 16 total years of Catholic education. But the, the lake was a really good experience in that I met a wonderful mentor. Uh, and I hope that all of you have found mentors. Dr. Mark Kramer, who was a psychology teacher. And she was very involved with the Democratic Party. So she introduced me to every Democratic leader in town. And that also meant she introduced me to the four or five Latino uh, folks that were elected to office, that was Albert Peña, Andrew B., uh, Joe Bernal, and Pete Boris. I was here. When I'm coming up, we can't look and say there's a Julian Pasto, there's a Norma Chavez, there's a, we can't do that. They're a handful. And they're just beginning to come on state legislature. And they're just beginning to come on not even school boards. If you can believe that, there weren't any Latinos on school boards. And there were very few teachers that were like um, This is a situation we find ourselves in at the time. And so one of the things that, that in looking at what was needed, we found that the dominant party, which was a Democratic party, which was made up of conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats. The conservatives, as you know, then migrated to become the Republican Party. <laughs> but, but at that time, we're looking at legislation that puts more money into cattle and sheep, into highways, than into education for its people. Some may argue that it's still the case, and that it's lost the case the other day. But, but at that time, one of the things that we're faced with, I'm coming out of high school, the dropout rate for Latinos is 80%. Think about that. 20% are surviving. The college going rate for Latinos is 4%. I was in the 4%. I mean, anybody worth their salt could say, there's no reason for this. We're not stupid people. 
we're not uh, folks who can't learn. We're not, because we speak another language, it should not be a hindrance, it should be a plus. But despite that, nothing was happening for us. You have to remember, too, as organizers, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Facebook. We barely had computers. We were putting little cards into the computers. And that's how it works. Um, so there weren't all these tools. But we knew that if we did not want to see our children, that we didn't even have them, if we didn't want to see them face the same consequences of poor health, of poor housing, of poor roads and streets, of being jailed for having one joint, of going to war, being given an option of you'll go to jail or you'll go to Vietnam. Great option, right? If we didn't want to see the kind of institutional racism, the kind of um, setting aside and making as second class citizens of our people, that if we didn't want that to go on, then somebody had to stop it. We knew that self-determination, and that was the key to Rasenita and the Chicano, was the idea that no one was going to do it for you. It was obvious. No one was going to give you better health outcomes. No one was going to give you better housing. No one was going to give you a job. If we wanted things to change, the only people who could change things were us. And so, consequently, at our little lake, I learned very early on that, for example, I wanted to get involved in politics, and in, in order to do that, you had to, uh, we wanted to form a Young Democrats. In order to do that, the rules said you have to have a Young Republican. And we managed to find a little girl who wanted to be Young Republican. <laughs> <laughs> we had lots of people who wanted to be Young Democrats, but we couldn't have it without the other side. Okay, so never let things get in your way. There's always a way around. <laughs> and so we helped her find 10 people, just 10 people that would say they were young Republicans and we were able to start that club. But through Young Democrats, one of the things that we saw very quickly was that, for example, um, I was asked to go to speak before the state senate. Now, I'm 21 years old, 22 years old. The state senate is a rural, rural, white, older males. That's all. And, you know, who's this kid coming from San Antonio to speak to us? First of all, I didn't want to do it. I got tricked in the <laughs> but, but, but I felt struggling. My friends that I'd gone to high school with had gone to Vietnam. Some came back, some didn't. Some came back with PTSD, with optimums. They had sacrificed a lot, and I felt that if somebody was 18 years old and they could go be killed or kill people, they should have the right to determine, to take a vote on whether that should be done or not. And so, you know, we spoke to the group, but I learned a lot from it. They didn't change the, the right to vote 18, the federal government did that. And unfortunately, in a lot of our history, it has been the federal government through lawsuits many times that have made the changes, but it has been because there are groups of people organizing and agitating for those changes to happen. Um, one of the other things that, that I learned was that the efforts of individuals collectively move that needle. You know, sometimes when you organize and you put people together, you think, well, what was that all for? We lost. And I can remember um, there was a period in time when there was a lot of shootings by law enforcement of Chicanos, and we went before the Justice Department. Um, there was a big case here that a guy who was dying with Ben Sandoval, it doesn't get talked about much, but was a real leader in that area. He um, took cases, and one of them was a case of a, a Mexicano who had been killed by the sheriff and his wife in Hayes County. They denied ever having seen him, he'd been jailed. They took him out, killed him out somewhere far away. Uh, and that case went to court, and finally he was found guilty. They were found guilty. And when that case was won, we said to ourselves, you know what, now it's over. We've won everything now. Those people will never think about killing a Chicano 
for another again. Well, that didn't happen. Yeah. And so, you know, I caution you because a lot of times there's highs and you think you've won something and then there's lows. But that's okay because the winds are not a straight path. The changes don't come in a year and two and three months. It takes a long period of time. And so in looking at what needed to be done, many of the folks around were looking at, we need a third party. You know, obviously the Republicans are not helping, the Democrats are very concerned, they're not doing anything other than protecting chief. Um, so we need to do something about organizing our folks to bring forth an agenda that is meaningful and important to our communities. Folks like Jose Angel Gutierrez, Nacho Perez, uh, Juan Patman, several of the folks had gotten together, they had formed Mayo. And in Mayo, they had set up a number of strategies, education, they had formed Casim Putrevino that my son's dad was involved with. Um, but they had also formulated a strategy for running for office, trying to build this new agenda, and trying to build a third party. Now, now I know that in this country, third parties don't usually really make it, right? So, uh, I didn't know that. So there was this whole hope that maybe we could create a party that was not just for Chicanos, but for all people, and that we could start to right some of the injustices. Um, the first thing we had to do was there were rules. Remember, there's always rules. Um, you've always got to deal with it. 